lasting impact by the newer test-playing countries had to await the years following the Second World War. Nevertheless, there were quality batsmen from those countries and none carried a heavier burden so independently and successfully as Jamaica's George Headley. In England and Australia, they called this wonderful little batsman the Black Bradman. At home in the Caribbean, they tended to think of Bradman as the White Headley. He was the first to invalidate the old credo that white man bat, black man ball. And despite the flow of batting talent to emerge from the West Indian territory since the war, Headley, the brave and inventive boy from Panama, still stands alone. Clifford Roach, on the right here, scored the first century in Test cricket for West Indies, and his partner, Ivan Barrow, scored the first for West Indies in England at Manchester in 1933. But one West Indian batsman stands out as the most exciting all-round cricketer of the period, perhaps of all time, Leary Constantine, fast bowler, electric field fielder, batsman who could swing the course of a match in half an hour's frantic stroke play. South Africa's... There's much more to West Indies cricket than just hitting a cricket ball. Anywhere, anytime. But when cricket first arrived in the Caribbean in the 18th century, cricket was in the grip of slavery and intended for whites only. Black people would not have been allowed to play. However, they had a role peripherally. They were called in to bowl to the white batsmen. The man who owns me. This is one arena where I could now confront him not just as an equal, but probably even as somebody superior. After slavery was abolished in 1834, black West Indians began to be called to play alongside whites. But the racial stereotypes which divided West Indian society also dictated the roles played on the cricket field. The tradition of West Indies cricket spoke in terms of a division of labor on the game of play along lines of race and class. So, and that was how the game was framed. Out of Trinidad in the 1920s emerged a cricketer who would challenge this apartheid. Hello everybody, this is Larry Constantine. I have a tale to relate, it concerns the pride of this land. Events we should celebrate in the whole of the Caribbean. This thing is no mystery, something to excite we. Rewriting of history by one special man. Who was Lord Leary Constantine? He was an amazing cricketer, an author, a politician, a phenomenal barrister, and of course an international statesman. Constantine set the template for how West Indians would play the game. Our fast bowlers must have long runs and must bowl quickly, and the batsmen must be very different from the British batsmen. Constantine inspired black West Indian cricketers. And in the 1930s, a specialist batsman from Jamaica surfaced. Headley, batting at number three, scored an unbeaten 270, leading the West Indies to their first ever series victory over England in the Caribbean. But a black captain was needed for the team to progress. Cricket in the West Indies is the most obvious example of the black man being held back. And West Indies cricket will never reach its full potential until it has a black captain. Leary Constantine's second achievement was to lay the foundation of the Race Relations Act that was to come. He was barred from going to the Great Russell Hotel. In those days, there was Colabar. Leary Constantine, however, the consummate diplomat, decided to take the hotel to court. He won, and he was awarded the paltry sum of five pounds. Headley and Constantine were the first cricket heroes to Black West Indians, and their achievements on the field inspired confidence that it was time too for political and social change. As the white elite resisted, the situation became increasingly volatile, and a series of demonstrations and general strikes swept across the region. The Caribbean people have been the most rebellious people in history the most rebellious people in history. I don't say revolutionary, I say rebellious. I like to begin with the island of Barbados. One of those to grow up in these ghettos was batsman Everton Weeks from Barbados. Weeks was part of the West Indies team which prepared to tour England in 1950. London is the place for me. London 
this lovely city. You can go to France or America, India, Asia or Australia, but you must come back to London City. This tour held special significance, as two years earlier the SS Windrush sailed from Jamaica, bringing a first contingent of West Indians to Britain. Its arrival began an era of mass migration of West Indians looking for a new life in the mother country. And West Indies cricket was also entering a new era. Although still led by a white captain, this team contained a new generation of black cricketers. The West Indies arrived for the second test at Lords as definite underdogs. But Sonny Ramadan, bowling in tandem with off-spinner Alf Valentine, shocked England spinning the West Indies to their first victory on English soil. When the final wicket fell, jubilant West Indian fans followed Calypso musicians Lord Kitchener and Lord Beginner onto the field for a victory parade. Their song became an anthem for West Indies cricket and the press now labelled the players Calypso cricketers. In the third test at Trent Bridge, Worrell and Weeks put on a record partnership of 283. They went on to win both this game and the final match to seal an historic 3-1 series victory. It came at a time when West Indians were immigrating to England and when they got there, they were struggling. So the West Indies team triumphing in England at that time was a great boost to West Indians in England. But it also was a great boost to the West Indian movement towards self-determination in the West Indies. At that time, politically, West Indies were moving towards independence from, from Britain. What is to be the future of Montserrat? What is to be the future of St. Vincent? These islands mean nothing at all. They are just pieces of dirt in the Caribbean Sea. What is to happen to them? They are a gifted people, a 20th century people, who are living in an economy which is the really perfect example of the 17th century economy. The 17th century economy and the 20th century people, they cannot fit, something is bound to go. Those islands by themselves cannot do it. There must be a federation of the whole of the Caribbean. In 1958, Britain agreed to grant federation status to the West Indies. The hope was that these disparate Caribbean territories could forge a political and economic union and eventually gain full independence as a single West Indian nation. It was surely the greatest day in the history of Trinidad. All Port of Spain turned out in the intense heat to cheer Princess Margaret as Her Royal Highness slowly drove to the Red House to inaugurate the first federal legislature of the West Indies. But what you got here is power. 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 